precious metals community loves a good conspiracy theory. It seems that the wilder the stories, the more views certain videos get. There are some pretty wild assumptions being made about what happens behind closed doors, and it makes for some fun entertainment, but frankly, it's just a distraction away from what is hidden in plain sight. Would you all like to know how the deck is stacked against you? I'll offer you no conspiracy theory, but if you follow along with me as I do some simple math, I will show you how some sleight of hand makes one particular type of investment that is aggressively marketed to the masses look wildly more attractive than it really is. And that investment is stocks. And I don't have to make pessimistic assumptions about performance to show you how the deck is stacked against you in the stock game. All I need to do is show you the effect of inflation and the current tax code. So come along with me. Let the conspiracy free entertainment begin. Here are the assumptions that we'll make for this analysis. We'll start with the rate of destruction in the dollar's purchasing power, otherwise known as price inflation. We'll use as the anchor point the year 1971, which was the year the dollar's link to gold was severed. The consumer price index, or CPI in this year, was 39.8. By the year 2015, the CPI had climbed to 233.7. Thus, we can see that for the past 45 years, the dollar has lost purchasing power by about 4% per year. We'll assume that in the future, the rate of purchasing power decline remains roughly 4% per year. Now, we'll need to make some assumptions about stock performance. Generally, the rate of return a person can expect from stocks is equal to the dividends paid, plus the rate of growth in earnings that the businesses generate, plus the change in the price-to-earnings ratio. Although the price-to-earnings ratio is fairly high now, we'll give stocks the benefit of the doubt and assume that the P-to-E ratio does not contract going forward. We'll assume that stocks stay as richly valued in the future as they are now. This is a very optimistic assumption, but as I said, I'll give stocks the benefit of the doubt and still show that they are not nearly as good a deal for the average saver as Wall Street suggests. Now, in terms of earnings growth, we know that in 1971, the earnings of the S&P 500 was 5.16. In 2015, the earnings was 101.29. This is an annualized growth rate of 7% per year, and we'll assume that corporate America can maintain this earnings growth rate going forward. To this, we can add the current dividend yield of 2.04%, and this gives us an expected rate of return of 9% per year. Again, we'll make the optimistic assumption that this is the rate of return that we'll get going forward in stocks. It's pretty close to what Wall Street tells everyone, so I think even our most avid stock enthusiasts won't give me too much flack over this performance assumption for this study. Lastly, we'll need to make some assumptions about taxes. Let's assume that our investor holds a stock index mutual fund outside of a tax-sheltered account. This should be an okay assumption because most of the gains are going to be from growth, not dividends. So as long as the investor doesn't sell until the end, the tax burden on dividends should not really be that big a deal. Plus, by holding stocks outside of a tax-sheltered uh, account, the investor gets the benefit of paying a smaller tax rate on dividends and long-term capital gains as opposed to paying the higher rate that is taxed on realized income when withdrawals are made from an IRA or a 401k because it's taxed as ordinary income when it's withdrawn from those vehicles. So that said, the federal tax rate will be 15%. Let's assume that the investor lives in a state that charges 7% income tax. You might need to adjust this assumption for where you live but many people will have state income tax rates that are in this ballpark. Now, let's assume that the investor picked a very low cost mutual fund and only pays 0.1% per year in fees. Okay, now with all of these assumptions out of the way, let's see how our investor might expect to do. Our investor starts saving $10,000 in year one and saves over a 20 year period. Each year, our investor puts the money into the selected S&P 500 index mutual fund. Each year, he or she increases the amount of money saved by 4% to keep up with inflation. This chart shows how the amount of money saved goes up each and every year. By year 20, the investor is saving a little over $20,000 per year. It's a much higher nominal amount, 
but the purchasing power of the $20,000 in year 20 is similar to the purchasing power of the $10,000 saved in year 1. In nominal terms, we can see how much cumulative money our investor parted with to purchase shares of the mutual fund. By the end of the 20th year, the investor had spent roughly $300,000 in total on mutual fund shares. Of course, in reality, the investor sacrificed significantly less in terms of real purchasing power. Remember, inflation averages 4%, and so the dollars invested later in time aren't worth as much as the dollars invested in the first few years. We can adjust for this fact. The real value of the money spent each year is actually $10,000. This is because our investor increases the amount of money spent on stocks by 4% per year. Thus, every year the investor parts with $10,000 worth of current purchasing power. So by the end of the 20th year, the investor actually sacrificed $200,000 worth of purchasing power, not $300,000. And why did our investor part with this money instead of spending it and enjoying it? Well, to build his or her wealth, of course. Our investor hopes that by foregoing spending and buying an investment and waiting, the value of the investment at the end of the holding period of time, say 20 years, will be much greater than the total value of the money that was not spent. Wall Street tells us that the magic of compounding will make us rich over time. So let's see how stocks work their magic shall we? Our investor plunks $10,000 in constant dollar terms into a stock mutual fund and doesn't sell. Over time, the mutual fund pays out dividends, which the investor reinvests into the mutual fund, and the shares grow in value as the earnings of the underlying companies grow by 7% per year. In this chart, I show how the nominal value of the investor's portfolio changes over time. By year 20, the investor has a portfolio worth $700,000 in nominal terms. Seems like a pretty good deal, doesn't it? Our investor spent $300,000 in nominal dollars and now has $700,000 in nominal dollars at the end of 20 years. The magic of compounding, right? Well, this picture that I'm showing you here is omitting a few very important things. Let's discuss them and correct for them. First, we need to consider that as dividends are paid, the tax man is going to want to take a bite. We also need to consider that the mutual fund is going to charge some fees. I've subtracted out the taxes and fees. You'll notice that doing so didn't really change the picture by all that much. The investor still has close to $700,000 in nominal dollars at the end of the 20-year period. The total impact was less than $50,000. And this further reinforces what I said earlier, that it doesn't really matter much if we were to do this analysis in a tax-sheltered account. Of course, we're leaving out another important factor, and that is that the uh, $650,000 or so reflected on the investor's mutual fund statement isn't really his or hers to spend. The investments need to be liquidated to put spendable cash into the investor's pockets. And so we need to consider the impact of uh, taxes upon liquidation. So let's add that effect in. I'm showing this effect in each year. This chart shows how much actual spendable wealth our investor has if a decision is made to liquidate in any one of the 20 years. At the very end, we can see that our investor still has roughly $600,000 of nominal wealth at his or her command. All the investor needs to do is liquidate the $650,000 balance in the mutual fund pay the 15% federal tax on long-term capital gains, and then pay the state tax. Now, all this said, our investor appears to have made out pretty well. He or she has quite a pile of wealth after taxes and fees are deducted. Of course, one thing we haven't done yet is correct for inflation. Remember, we had to do the calculations in nominal dollars because taxes and fees are based upon nominal dollars. But in the meantime, the dollar has lost purchasing power over this 20-year period. We need to show what the investor will have left in terms of real purchasing power. And there we go. After 20 years of 4% inflation, the sizable wealth holding our investor had, had turns out to be worth less than half in terms of actual purchasing power. Nominally, the investor has $600,000 of spendable cash after paying taxes and fees. 
But in terms of real purchasing power, the investor actually has less than $300,000. And this brings me to my final graph. Let's chart the purchasing power of the stock mutual fund against the cumulative purchases made by the investor during this 20-year window. And here's what we end up with. It doesn't look very impressive, does it? We gave stocks the benefit of the doubt by making some very generous assumptions. And you'll note that even after 20 years, they did not enrich our investor in the way that Wall Street marketing literature would suggest. Our investor does have more wealth than if he or she had not bought stocks in the first place, but it is not multiples more as is often promised. One might argue that this does not give stocks enough time to work their magic. That might be true, but how many of us have more than 20 years or so to save and invest a significant amount of money? Remember, the first few years of a person's working life are spent building a household and spending money on raising kids. Most people find that they can accumulate wealth the most quickly in the last two decades of work. In addition, as one approaches the end of a person's working career, it is prudent to scale back on speculative holdings. The last thing a person wants is for a stock market crash to force a decade-long delay in a person's retirement plans. Now, the other reason why the showing is less than impressive is that taxes are levied on nominal gains, not real gains. Thus, inflation takes what would otherwise look like a spectacular gain and it puts it into government coffers. Have you ever wondered why the government needs inflation? Look no further. Stable prices are a disaster for tax revenues. But think through the implications of what you see here. It suggests that the lion's share of a person's wealth at the end of a career of savings results from deferred consumption, not from some investment vehicle promising the magic of compounding growth. What one really needs to do to become wealthy is to save in a vehicle that preserves its purchasing power and one that is not taxed as it increases in price. Know any vehicles that fit that bill? I know a few, and I don't need to provide you with any conspiracy theories to convince you of their merits.